Thank you, Lynn, for our song this morning, and thank you, Gail, for our uh, prayer. We always start uh, Bible class here with a prayer, and we're very grateful for the opportunity that we have to be together. Uh, we are grateful for our visitors today, and we're very grateful for our friends on the TGRN radio network that are listening in with us this morning. We're very happy to have you as well. We welcome you to our spring gospel meeting. Even though it's threatening outside and there's a lot of rumbling going on outside, still we're very comfortable and safe here on the inside. And uh, we're very happy that we have this opportunity to discuss the subject, I Can Trust My Bible. This is going to be the theme that we're going to discuss all the way through our meeting this year. Uh, we have a meeting every spring, and uh, we selected this theme. And uh, we're very happy that we could have this opportunity to be together and study God's Word. We can trust our Bible. That's very much the focus of our discussion. And each lesson will build on that. We will progress a little closer and a little closer. And I hope that by the time we continue all the way through our study and our coursework together, that we will draw the conclusion, I can trust my Bible. Uh, the Bible is the greatest book in all the world. You hear me say that quite a bit. Now, that's the result of a lot of study and a lot of careful consideration about the Bible. That's the result of a lot of years in studying the Bible. But I haven't always been that way. I haven't always been the kind of person who had complete faith and trust in the Bible. But over years of study, I grew that way. I grew to have the kind of trust that God wants me to have in the Word of God, and I want you to have that kind of trust as well. I selected 2 Timothy 3, 14 through chapter 4, verse 5, as uh, the text for our gospel meeting, and we will be uh, referencing that as time goes along in our discussions. But I would like to uh, begin today with 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Rather than go to my text, which I'll refer to in our lesson this morning from the pulpit, I want to go to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Now, this is a Bible verse that you're very familiar with. And we've read it quite a bit, and it needs to be read quite a bit. It's, it's one that really is an important Bible passage for us all. You know, the Bible has a purpose for being written. Uh, to really come to trust my Bible, I've got to understand the purpose of the Bible. Why was the Bible written to begin with? That's the first step. A lot of times people will go to the Bible, and I don't understand its purpose. And for that reason, they don't get out of the Bible like the lesson that they should. Many times people will read into the Bible what was never intended for it to say. But we don't want to do that. We want the Bible to speak to us so that we understand the message of God. Part of that means I've got to understand the purpose behind the Bible. Now, books are written all the time. In fact, I heard someone say that if you could read uh, just a book an hour, 24 hours a day, you'd probably be six years behind by the end of today because so many books are being written and so many books are being produced all the time, especially now with the advent of electronic publishing. There's a lot of publishing that is going on electronically, not only with uh, paper but with e-readers and that sort of thing, and that's always a, an interesting aspect that we have before us. But each one of these books and each one of these documents that are coming forward today have a purpose. Sometimes, uh, you know, it might be to record historical facts. Or the purpose of the publication might be uh, to persuade you. Or it might be to expose some particular idea. It might be to entertain you. Well, the Bible has a purpose. Now, my opinion on this matter, and your opinion really doesn't matter, uh, what I've got to do is go to the Bible itself and come to understand what is its purpose. I can give you my opinion about the matter. That really is not going to help you. You can give me your opinion about the matter, and that's not really going to get us anywhere. If I'm going to find out what the contents of a bottle happens to be, I've got to get inside the bottle. If I want to know what the contents are, I've got to get inside the bottle to examine the contents. Well, that's the way it is with the Bible. I've got to get inside the Bible and examine it for myself to see what its purpose is. 
And of course, one of the great purposes that we see is that uh, we have this responsibility. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Now that, Paul gives that instruction to Timothy. And that instruction, by implication, is given to the rest of us. We're going to do our best to present ourselves to God. You know, it would be good for us to think about it this way. I'm not going to try to present myself to the congregation. I'm not going to try to present myself to uh, the popular culture of our day and what they want. I'm not going to try to present myself to a cross-section of the brotherhood. I'm not going to try to present myself to a particular denominational aspect or position. I'm going to try my best to present myself to God. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. I'm going to present myself to God and work at this matter. And I know when I do that and I draw the right conclusions, I as a worker am going to be approved by God. That's what I want. It's not so much that I want the praise and the applause of people. If I wanted the praise and the applause of people, why, you know, I'd try to be uh, maybe a, a pro football player. Couldn't be that, but I might try it. Or maybe uh, an entertainer or, or maybe, uh, maybe a politician if I wanted the applause and the approval of mankind. But if we want the pr- applause and the approval of God, then we've got to be a workman. We've got to be a workman where? In this word. And we've got to cut it straight. And that's much of what he's saying here. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling. Now that little phrase, rightly handling, is another phrase I'd like to talk about for a brief moment. When I introduce the subject, I can trust my Bible. It means to cut it straight, and it goes to the idea of um, when moms used to make those shirts, you know, and they would lay the pattern out on the cloth, and they would cut it along the pattern. Then they would take the different pieces, and they would sew them together, and a shirt would be made. you got to cut it just right according to the pattern, and that's what God's saying about the Word of God. Cut it straight. Uh, Cut it right along the lines. Be a workman that's more concerned about presenting himself before God as being approved than he is people. And cut it straight. Uh, study, study it right. And apply it properly to yourself. What I'm saying is the first step in growing in trusting my Bible is to understand why it was written. We've got to understand the purpose of the Bible. Is it written just to entertain? Is it written just to record facts? Is it just written to expose? Is it just written as reference material? That's what we want to discover today. This morning we want to study why was the Bible written. And when I can come to understand better why the Bible was written, then I can grow in my trust of the Bible. That's the first step. And then we're going to take other steps as our lessons progress and as our meeting continues. We're going to grow in the trust and the confidence of our Bible. Not every book has the same purpose. If you don't believe that, uh, try reading Carl Sandburg's Lincoln to your little children at night at bedtime. I mean, it's not going to work. I mean, Or maybe Shire's Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. Read that as a bedtime story for your little children. It's not going to work. But what you would read for them would be Mother Goose. So you would read for them uh, Dr. Seuss or some uh, uh, little story like that at bedtime, which I always did with kids. And you do with your kids as well. Not every book has the same purpose. And the Bible has a unique purpose, and we need to understand that. If we're ever going to understand our Bible, and if we're ever going to trust our Bible, if we ever get to the point where we can say, I can trust my Bible, we're going to have to understand the purpose of the Bible. And to do that, in the best way that I know how, I'm going to look at two angles. I'm going to talk about, first of all, what is not the purpose of the Bible. Uh, Why it was not written. And that's going to take most of our time this morning. We're going to devote ourselves to that point. 
why it was not written. And then in our morning worship service, I can't go away from this building with just the first point. I've got to. I wouldn't be able to sleep tonight if I didn't cover the second purpose, why it was written. So I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about why it was written. And I have to tell you, I get more cranked up about why it was written than I do about why it was not written, though both are very important subjects. And so I want to talk with you this morning in our Sunday morning Bible class. Those of you good folks who are with us today and those who are listening to the uh, lesson on the radio, let's um, study why the Bible was not written. And this is important for me to know. It's going to help me understand my Bible, and it's going to help me grow where I can say I can trust my Bible. Why was it not written? It was not written for profit. Bible was not written for profit. Now, there's a lot of profit in publishing Bibles. I have to tell you that, and I want to distinguish the matter very carefully for you. Uh, the Bible was not written for profit, monetary gain. There's, there's monetary gain in publishing Bibles. And uh, there's all kinds of uh, Bibles that are being published out there. And I don't know if anyone really knows. Maybe Google knows uh, or Siri. Maybe they know how many religious publishing houses are out there. I don't know. I don't know... I'm sure somebody would know how many Bibles are published every year. And then you add to that not only the paper publishing, but you also add electronic publishing. Uh, there's a lot of electronic publishing that's going on all the time. And you have some very big publishing houses now. And you have, when you think about publishing, you have some uh, big uh, foundational Publishers. There's probably 12 big publishers in the United States today. Scribner's, Doubleday, things of that sort, Bantam Books. A lot of these are subsidiaries of larger companies. There's a lot of publishing going on, and you know why they do that? To make money. They do that to make money. They know that when you buy a book, it's going to make money. There's a lot of people out there who want to write books. And uh, they want to uh, become an author, and they feel like, oh, this is a very sophisticated thing to be, to be an author. And, and, uh, they want to write, and they want to write books for money. It's a way of making money. And some people are very good at it. Why, we read all the time, and they, they write some very entertaining and some very helpful books, and some of them are just... Very interesting books. And have you ever been to those books where you just couldn't put it down and it was such an interesting story? Well, you ought to read. You ought to read books. But the Bible was not written for that purpose. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. And in verse 8, I have a statement that's always amazed me about Paul and the Bible and uh, that particular matter that we're studying for the present. Um, in verse 8, he says, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. I'm in Philippians chapter 3, and I noticed verse 8, and it's just one verse that I could have picked out out of many verses where he says, now, I've suffered the loss of everything. And if you looked at his life, you could see where he had a great deal, and he had a great deal of uh, influence and a great deal of family prestige and a great deal of, of future in the Jewish religion, but he said, I counted it all but loss. I've suffered the loss of everything, and I count it as rubbish in order that I may know Christ. They did not produce the Bible. Inspired men did not produce the Bible for what they could get out of it. It was not written for profit. Now, a lot of times we think that way because we're in a Western culture and we're in a very pragmatic culture and we're thinking, can this make me money? Can this produce? And there's nothing wrong in that. I want you to know that that's not why the Bible was produced. I want you to know it was not written in order for profit. 
And then I have uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 9. You might want to uh, notice that particular passage, and I have much more, many more verses uh, in mind that I could cite than I have time to uh, reference. But in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 9, I'll come back to this passage in a minute. For I think that, uh, he says, God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. And I need to spend more time talking about the context of that, and I will a little later. But that comes to my mind for this reason. Paul is saying it seems like we got the sentence of death, but they keep preaching and they keep teaching. I need to tell you the story of uh, uh, Tyndall, John Tyndall. John Tyndall, I'll tell you more about that tonight when you're back with me, but Tyndall um, was one of the early translators of the Bible into English. And Tyndall's translation is a lot of what the King James Version is based on. And yet he was hunted as a fugitive, and he really was a bounty hunter's nightmare because he would dress up in disguise and go over here and live there for a while and work on his translation and send it back to England. And they would try to confiscate copies of the translation and destroy them. And then he would go to another uh, country in disguise and stay with people over there. And they were hunting for him and trying to find John Tyndall. They finally discovered him as he was betrayed by a friend. And you know what they did to Tyndall? They put him in prison, and then they were merciful to him. They strangled him, and then they burned him at the stake. Do you know what his crime was? Translating the Bible. The Bible was not produced for profit. His crime was translating the Bible into English. And you and I are the recipients of the blessings of people like that, like Paul. Now, I'm not trying to put Tyndall up on the same level as the Apostle Paul. I'm just saying there have been a lot of sacrifices like that. When Paul said, I did that, we didn't do this for profit. I've lost everything, but I count everything that I once had as rubbish for a knowledge of Jesus Christ. Why, we are like people who have the death sentence on us every single day. But here, we're doing it, we're translating this, we're writing this, as Paul would say, by inspiration, so that you can know about the wonderful mystery that is to be found in the church and in Christ, Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 3. The Bible was not written for profit. It wasn't written for monetary gain. There is monetary gain to be had by producing Bibles, but that is not its purpose. I'm talking about why the Bible was not written, and I'll tell you why it was not written. It wasn't written to satisfy our intellectual curiosity. Now, we're intellectual type beings, and God created us that way. We have minds, and we have abilities, and we are interested and we're curious and we're looking and we want to know. And I don't know how many times I've been in Bible class here and other places where somebody asks a question and I say, well, I wish I knew more about that. And I really do. Or sometimes I'm reading the Bible and I will study these particular matters and I'll say, well, why does he say that this way at this time? And I'm going over that in my mind and I'd like to know more about that because God created us that way. He created us with a curiosity about us. He created us with a, an intellectual ability about us. And we want to dig down deeper and we want to look. And that's just the way we're made. That's the way God created us. Turn with me to Acts chapter 17. Man has always been that way. In Acts chapter 17, you have a Bible passage about, you know, very intelligent people. Paul is in Athens. Athens was the center of learning. And here you have the intelligentsia of the day. These are the real wise guys. These are the real uh, powerful thinkers. And Athens has had a reputation for many, many years of great philosophers and great thinkers. And now the gospel of Christ comes to Athens. And here Paul is taken to this Areopagus. The Areopagus was a place, might have been a hill type thing, referred to the Areopagus. But the Areopagus was more of a... Um, a forum. 
and um, a forum for talking about things and looking at things and discussing things. And this great sermon in Acts chapter 17 begins at about verse 22. But what caused me to think about this was verse 21. And you and I love to read and study these particular passages, but it's verse 21 that's got my attention for the present. Now, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. They liked it. They liked new things. They liked new ideas. They liked this intellectual curiosity. But I want you to know that the Bible was not written just to satisfy our intellectual curiosity. There's more to it than that. There's a lot in the Bible that challenges us. It was Augustine who said a long time ago, I've heard preachers cite this, it was really Augustine who said it, you know, the Bible is like the ocean. You know, right near the shore, a little baby can crawl on the shore in the water, but then there are depths to the ocean that would drown the largest elephant. And the Bible is like that. There are parts that are very simple to understand and very shallow. There are parts that are so deep that no mere human mind can plummet the depths of the knowledge that is presented. And then you have interesting passages like Deuteronomy 29 and 29. If you haven't read that, go to it and read it sometime. The, the deep things, the knowledgeable things belongs to God. We're not going to know everything. It is not written simply to satisfy our intellectual curiosity. Sometimes people will come to me and they'll say, Brother Lord, I want to talk to you about it. And they'll tell me about their problems. And I'm telling you right now, I'm not a good counselor, so don't come to me. I'm not a good counselor. And um, they will say, uh, well, what do you think about this? And I'll say, well, here are the three questions I ask every counselee. Do you want to know what the Bible says about this problem? And they'll answer yes to that because they have a basic curiosity about them. And then I ask, are you willing to do what the Bible says about this problem? And at that point, sometimes they begin to hesitate and they hedge. But sometimes they'll say, yeah, I want to know what it says. And I want to know what the Bible tells me to do. And then I ask them a third question. Are you willing to do it right now? Are you willing to start right now doing what the Bible tells you to do about this problem? Are you willing to do that? And right there is where I lose a lot of them. Because they start doubting. And they start hedging. And they think, well, I don't know. And I had one lady say, I, there's no telling what kind of passage you're going to pull out of that Bible. I said, are you willing to do it? She said, well, I don't know whether I'm willing to do it. I said, then I don't know that I can help you. I don't know that I can help you. Now, I'm just a preacher. If you want to know what the Bible says, I can tell you. Are you willing to do it? And are you willing to do it right now? Everybody says yes to the first question because they're curious. But the Bible was not written just to satisfy our curiosity. The Bible wasn't written for us just to read and say, hmm, well, that's an interesting thing. There's more to the Bible than that. The Bible obviously is enjoining upon us a responsibility to do something about this problem and to do it right now, start doing it right now. So as I said, I'm not a very good counselor in that regard. The Bible was not written to perpetuate superstitions and cultures and that kind of thing. There's a lot of cultural elements that are found in the Bible. And I, I copied down just one or two that I thought would be uh, interesting for us. Isn't this an interesting cultural element it's in Genesis chapter 24. Let's go to that. You're going to find a lot of cultural elements in the Bible. You're going to find people with a lot of superstitious ideas in the Bible. And I thought, well, where shall I go to illustrate this point? And I just happened to think of Genesis chapter 24, and I'll start with verse 1. Abraham, um, uh, now Abraham, Genesis 24, 1, was old. Well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh, 
that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I will dwell. Now, I'll not go any further or deeper into that particular point or the context of that passage, but isn't that an interesting cultural element there? Uh, that this was a means by which one would swear to do this or swear not to do that. Isn't that an interesting cultural element? But the Bible wasn't written just to propagate culture. It wasn't written just to propagate the uh, cultural elements of the day. Turn with me to a passage in the book of Ruth. I always thought this was an interesting uh, uh, passage. And um, it's found for us in Ruth chapter 4. And you'll remember this wonderful story of Ruth, Naomi, and, and uh, here's Ruth and Boaz and that kind of thing. And they're at the city gates. And you come to about verse 7. Ruth chapter 4, 7. I always thought it was an interesting cultural element here. And in um, uh, that particular passage, it simply says, Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was the manner of attesting in Israel. You notice how culturally it added that element to our Bible. Uh, Ruth chapter 4, verse 7 and verse 8. And again, there's wonderful lessons associated and attached to this particular story, but that's not our point for the present. Our point for the present is the Bible was not written just to promote that. The Bible was not written to promote ancient cultures or cultural issues such as that. The Bible had another purpose in mind altogether. Turn with me to a New Testament illustration. And I copied um, this particular passage down, and it's found for us in Acts chapter 14, and I thought this will be a, a good uh, illustration of the superstitious minds that some people had back then. And you know what? I'm convinced that some people have superstitious minds today. The Apostle Paul's in Lystra, and um, it's amazing at about Acts chapter 14 and verse 11, what happens? He and Barnabas are there. And let me read a verse or two, and you'll see how superstitious these people really were. Acts 14, 11. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lyconian, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. And the priests of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifices or sacrifice to the crowds or with the crowds. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Verse 15. His point is, your superstitious beliefs really have no basis. Uh, we're trying to tell you about the one true living God. Turn from these superstitious beliefs, get them behind you, and start following the gospel of Christ. You'll find a lot of cultural elements in the Bible. It'll talk about the cultural elements of the people of the day. It will talk about the superstitious beliefs that those people had in the day. But it was not written to promote that. It was not written to uh, perpetuate that. It had a different purpose entirely with regard to the matter. And I copied down just a number of superstitions and that kind of thing. But I don't think that I, I uh, should spend a lot of time with this other than this point, which does need to be made. And that's in Second Peter chapter 1. And I do want to spend just a brief second there on that. In Second Peter chapter 1 you have verse 16. And this is a great verse. You ought to mark it in your Bible. 2 Peter 1, verse 16. For we did not follow cunningly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. Now, that verse needs a little analysis. In 2 Peter chapter 1, and verse 16, Peter is saying, Christianity is not based on myth. 
It's not based on cunningly devised fables. Now, the Greeks love that. The Greeks love their fables. They love their myths. They love their storytelling. But he's making it clear. The Scripture wasn't based on that. The Scripture wasn't written for that reason, to perpetuate some kind of myth. When we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking about the second coming of Christ right there. When he says in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 16, we didn't follow cunningly devised faith. This is not a myth. This is not some kind of fancy tale. This is not some superstitious invention which people came up with. When we're talking about the second coming of Christ, that is a real thing that's going to happen. And then he goes on and references the transfiguration of Christ in the last portion of the verse, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. He was an eyewitness of the majesty of Christ along with Moses and Elijah and James and John when they witnessed the transfiguration of Christ referenced for us in Matthew chapter 17. Some people, and I guess I'm spending a little time with this particular point, because some people have tried to turn great Bible stories into myth like the Genesis flood. And they tried to say, well, that didn't really happen. When all of the evidence that we have seen really indicates, as far as scientific explanation and geological explanation, it actually did take place. We went to see a movie not too long ago about that. And it was amazing the um, uh, facts that these experts in their respective fields were able to relate to us in studying the geologic makeup of the land and that kind of thing pertaining to that matter. Point being, the Bible's not a myth. The idea of Jonah being swallowed. Some have tried to make that a myth. The idea that Moses uh, gave the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai written by the hand of God. Some have tried to make it a myth. The idea, the very idea, that Jesus was not a real historical figure. Some have tried to turn that into a myth. Peter says, we didn't follow myths. We didn't build upon myths. We didn't invent this particular thing. We were eyewitnesses of His majesty. We saw it before our eyes. And a number of these Bible writers make reference to that. The point for the present is the Bible does not come to perpetuate some kind of culture or perpetuate some kind of superstition or develop some kind of myth. But let me press along because I want you to understand that the Bible is not an eschatological roadmap. And you think, well, whoa, what? what? kind of word is that? And if you're in my auditorium Bible class, you'll recognize that word eschatological because we've been studying that on different frameworks and in different contexts. But eschatological or eschatology is a study of final things, the study of last things. That's what eschatology means. Uh, eschatology, what's the end going to be like? Now, the Bible says a lot about that. The Bible tells us a lot about what the end will be like. It doesn't matter where you are in the New Testament. It's going to be talking about the second coming of Christ somewhere. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John chapter 14. I'm coming again. Beautiful passage. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again. I'm coming back. So in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, one of the great themes of that section of the Bible is the second coming of Christ. That's eschatology, eschatological. Book of Acts, book of history. Acts chapter 1. An angel, an angel comes and says, Why stand you gazing upward into heaven? The same Jesus is going to be coming again. 21 letters of the New Testament and the book of Revelation all relate to eschatological material talking about the second coming of Christ. But it was not written to try to find Adolf Hitler in the Bible or Mussolini in the Bible or Saddam Hussein in the Bible. I turned on the television this morning to look at the weather and uh, watch the Weather Channel. It's entertaining. I watch the Weather Channel and I like to watch it. And uh, they got all these cool graphics, and they're doing this stuff, and they're telling you about this stuff, and I just kind of like that stuff. And not that I know anything about it, I don't, but um, if 
First thing came on the television. Some guy is on television and he's on the book of Revelation. He's working Revelation 19 over, man. I'm sitting there listening to that guy. And I'm thinking, you really don't have a clue. The Bible wasn't written for that purpose. You're not going to see Henry Kissinger written in the Bible. There's not some kind of code in the Bible where God is trying to talk about a war with Russia or a war with China or a war with anybody with regard to this modern day and time. He's not talking about Napoleon. He's not talking about Hitler. He's not talking about Saddam Hussein. Ezekiel, Daniel, the book of Revelation was not written as some kind of modern day newspaper whereby you're going to come up with all kinds of these modern day events prophesied in the Bible. These are things that prophesied. It was never written for that purpose. And people get off on this particular point and they try to find by some kind of coded language in the Bible all these modern day events that are taking place on the world scene. The Bible was never written for that particular purpose. The Bible was not written to cause me pain and hurt. And sometimes people get that idea that if I read the Bible, it's going to really hurt me. So I need to talk about that just a little bit. And I wanted, I found 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and I think that's a good place for us to study. And it's a shame that our time is just gone. But I'm, I'm going to spend a brief minute, minute with 2 Corinthians 7 to try to show this point. The Bible wasn't written for the purpose to make me feel bad. Though, when I read the Bible, that might happen. The Bible wasn't written to cause me grief and pain, though when I read the truths of the Bible, that might happen. But that wasn't its purpose. And I found this passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And um, I guess, for time's sake, the best place is to begin at about verse 8. 4. Even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, for I see that that letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. Now when I wrote that first letter, I feel badly sorry that it hurt you, that it hurt your feelings. Things were going on at Corinth that were bad and needed straightening up and needed correcting and Paul by inspiration gives them the corrections. But he says, when I wrote that, I feel for you and it's only natural for me to feel for you that you were grieved by it because of this natural affection that I have for you. But I want you to know something. Even though it grieved you to learn of your error, it led you to repentance and I was glad about that. For godly grief, verse 10, produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. When you read the Bible and it makes your conscience hurt, that's a good thing. If it leads you to repentance. If it leads you to do what God has told you to do and you'll never regret that. If you read the Bible and it hurts and gouges your conscience and you in turn say, i got to do better, i got to change my life, I'm going to start living the way God has told me to live. You'll never regret that kind of situation, verse 10. Whereas worldly grief produces death. If all you have is just grief and you don't turn this life around, you're not going to benefit. The Bible was written for another purpose, not just to cause you grief, but if it does grieve you, if it does hurt your conscience, and make you feel bad, there's a purpose behind that, and there's a reason behind that. That reason is to produce or to bring about your changed life, which will result in your salvation. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, verse 11, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment, at every point, you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. They've repented. 
And I'm sorry that that letter was written so strongly. I have a natural affection for you, but that letter was written strongly so you would repent and you responded, and I rejoice over that. Though the purpose of the Bible is not to hurt, it may hurt because it shows the divine standard and I'm so far below it. But there's a benefit to that hurt which actually causes us to be more like what God wants us to be. Now, here's one I wanted to talk a lot about. And you hear a lot about this, and I'm out of time. We'll just have to save it for another day. And that is the Bible's purpose was not to promote self-esteem. Now, when you do the will of God, you will have great self-esteem. That certainly is a byproduct of following the Word of God. But that wasn't the purpose of the Bible. A lot of your positive mental attitude gurus go to the Bible and say, look, this is what the Bible says about this. This is what the Bible says about that. But that was not its purpose. It is a self-help book. It is a book that will help our self-esteem. It is a book that will help us improve our outlook about ourselves. But that's a byproduct of what the Bible really was written about. As we conclude our class today, simply because of the limitation of time, not because of a limitation of material, let us be dismissed by having a word of prayer, all right? Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the day. You blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus, and we're thankful. We're thankful for your love and your care of our lives physically. Thankful that we have the Bible, that we study and learn why it was written for our benefit. Thank you for the Bible, Heavenly Father. Thank you for all spiritual blessings. Continue to give us a wonderful day, a happy day. Give us life and health so that we might use both for you and for others. And in the end, heaven save us, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.